U.S. government agency that is responsible for monitoring our security in, in cyberspace and coordinating with the public and private sector to protect U.S. interests in cyberspace. Twitter, uh, Netflix, I think as well. So Twitter, Box, Netflix, The New York Times, Reddit was affected, Yelp, Pinterest, and PayPal. Wow. And this is just like a small sampling. In October of 2016, one of the biggest botnet attacks ever took place, and three young kids were the ones responsible for it. They put billion dollar companies out of business in the blink of an eye, and today we're going to talk about their story. The first out of these three that I want to talk about is named Josiah White, and that's because he's arguably the inventor of the Mirai botnet. Josiah grew up in rural Pittsburgh and had three older siblings. His family was reported to be very close-knit with Christian values. Josiah and all of his siblings were homeschooled, and that was because his mother believed it was better to, quote, find out how God had created them and what he had created them to pursue. Josiah was the baby of the family. He was thin with dark hair and very stubborn, but reportedly he was also a very nice kid. Josiah's father was originally an engineer, but he later became an insurance salesman. The family of six lived in a house they had bought and fixed up, surrounded by nothing but woods and farmland. One of Josiah's earliest memories is him following his dad around the house while he made electrical repairs and fixed up the house. In the year 2002, when Josiah was five years old, his parents got him the components of an electrical socket for Christmas. In the years following, his parents gave him a book called 101 electronics projects. Josiah's mother said that it wasn't long after this that he began begging her to take him to Radio Shack. He would even bring a list of things he needed, mostly consisting of breadboard componentry. And if you don't know what a breadboard is, don't panic, I'll explain. A breadboard is defined as a construction base used to build semi-permanent prototypes of electronic circuits. So basically, it allows people to practice their skills by building temporary electric circuits before doing it on a real job. Because of this early introduction into engineering and electrical work, Josiah was actually teaching his dad how to wire three-way switches for their house before he even turned 10 years old. As I mentioned earlier, Josiah's family was very Christian, so that means they went to church a lot. Josiah's father would oftentimes bring him to their church's car ministry, and they would repair members of the church's cars for free, as well as fix up donated vehicles for some of the church's missionaries. And Josiah didn't mind this because he loved getting the chance to impress all of the local adults with his many different skills. But it was wasn't his calling. He much preferred computers because they made more sense to him. And like most young kids at the time, he didn't have his own computer. The family shared one which made it hard for Josiah to get all the screen time he wanted. But around his 13th birthday, he finally got his own personal computer. It was also around this time that one of Josiah's older brothers, who was 7 years older than him, had just figured out a way to bypass his cell phone software and allow him to change their carriers. Josiah's brother did this for a little bit as a service that he would make money from. His service service became so popular that their father decided to open a computer repair store around this exact premise. When Josiah was 15 years old, he started to work at the family's computer shop after school. He was in charge of setting up windows for customers as well as installing antivirus software onto their computers. And after working at the computer shop for a little bit, he became interested in other parts, like how HTML worked or how to program, even things like web hosting and network protocols. He also completely learned Visual Basic, which is a programming language. Although Josiah's childhood was pretty easygoing, he reportedly said that he felt like he was being, quote, raised on rails, which kind of makes sense because he was pushed straight from homeschooling to the church and then to working at his dad's computer shop. Despite saying this, Josiah still enjoyed his childhood. The only things that really upset him was when his mom forced him to earn internet access through doing homework or limited his computer time. But as time went on and Josiah started to work more and more at the computer shop, these rules kind of faded away as it was part of his job. During these years, Josiah would spend a lot of his free time playing a video game called Uplink. The idea of this game was basically you had to choose between being a hacker that would war for two factions, either good or bad, and reportedly Josiah liked to play both sides when he was playing. He was also starting to learn about some of the most infamous hacks that have ever happened. The whole idea of hacking became very cool to him and kind of like some sort of club that he was in. And eventually he made his way over to the Hack Forums website, which is basically a marketplace of hackers of all ages. And 
to all success levels, selling and offering different services, and just discussing different hacks that they're up to right now. But it's not a very innocent place. A lot of big time hackers have been said to be using hack forums, and all of them are desperate for attention and money, so it's a terrible group of people doing illegal stuff. Not the best influence for a young kid. During this era of hacking on the internet, one of the most popular things to do was a DDoS attack. Basically that just denies the person direct access to their internet, so they can't do things like play games or surf the web. Around one year before Josiah was introduced to hack forums, the group known as Anonymous launched a DDoS attack against PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, and Bank of America in response to them refusing donations to the website WikiLeaks, which isn't a big deal to me because fuck Bank of America and fuck PayPal and W WikiLeaks, but most DDoS attacks weren't like this. They had no principles and were just purely out of hate, and the people on hack forums in particular were very quick to DDoS you for the most minor things. If you played any video games, but mostly Call of Duty between 2010 to 2015, I'm sure you've been booted off once before, and that little idiot was probably a member of hack forums. That website in particular was very known for having people hit offline during video game matches. Myself, during Black Ops 3, I got hit off and held offline for a week, so that was really fun. Josiah was beginning to spend more and more time on hack forums, and eventually he came across a post of someone describing how they had used a botnet in a DDoS attack, and this really intrigued Josiah. So he began researching and learning everything he possibly could on how to use botnets for his benefit. Eventually he came across an article talking about a game called Quake 3 Arena that exposed its weak points in security, mainly how there was a simple request you could input saying get info or get status and find out everything about that player's account. In Josiah's head this was a way he could prove himself to the hack forums community. So within a few hours he whipped up a little script and posted it to the hack forums website under his username. Oh no. 1479. Shortly after making this post, Josiah would meet one of his soon-to-be accomplices in a multi-billion dollar DDoS attack. His name was Dalton Norman, aka Mold Jelly. Dalton grew up in New Orleans, and like Josiah, his dad was also an engineer, but his dad was also the lead floor man of a maintenance team that worked on a skyscraper nearby. Before he was even a teenager, Dalton was writing his own scripts for cheating mods in video games he played, so he had a pretty natural knack for anything technology related. Dalton's childhood was not as easy as Josiah's was though. When he was younger, he had a really bad stutter that made him very self-conscious and scarred him for life. Even his own family would make fun of him at dinner, so you can imagine he was getting it pretty bad at school and other places. Thankfully, his stutter went away by the end of elementary school, so things started to seem like they were going to be better for him and he could actually have a chance at a normal childhood. But then tragedy struck. On August 23rd of 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans and devastated the area, so Dalton and his family were forced to flee to the neighboring state of Mississippi, where he'd have to adjust to a new school, make new friends, and just be living in uncertain territory. Dalton's parents enrolled him at a local Christian school, where kids would pray before class and one of the math teachers swore on his life that Barack Obama was the Antichrist. This was one of those Christian schools where if you didn't follow the rules or didn't pray the right way, you were probably going to get slapped with a ruler. When Dalton was just 12 years old, he wrote his first ever spam script, and he used it to attack one of the teachers he didn't like. He flooded her inbox with so many emails that her account shut down and she lost access to all of her old files and important emails. Within just a few short months of conducting this spam attack against his teacher, Dalton would launch a full-fledged DDoS attack against the school's Wi-Fi, and he made it completely unusable. No one could get any work done and no one could do anything at all. This went on for a few hours and then the school got so desperate that they actually had their IT staff ask Dalton for his help in fixing the internet, just because he had such a reputation reputation of being good with technology, and they had no clue he was the one who actually caused the internet to go out, so he used it as an opportunity to embarrass them. So before leaving to go help the IT staff, he shut off his attack script and made his way over to the closet where the router was kept. He opened the door and was greeted by one of the IT staff workers. Dalton then made his way over to the router, unplugged it for about 10 seconds, plugged it back in, and boom, the internet was magically working again. But evidently this wasn't enough for Dalton, because just a few months later he launched another DDoS attack attack against the school, only this time it wasn't as small. He sent so much traffic to their router that the circuits were completely fried and the router was unusable. 
When Dalton was around 13 or 14 years old, he saw the movie The Social Network, and apparently after seeing that, his whole worldview had changed. About taking the entire social experience of college and putting it online. The biggest message he took away from that movie was that with a laptop and a good idea, you can take control of your life. So Dalton set out to try to build his own social networking app, but he didn't know anything about attracting new users, advertising, budgeting, or anything. He was a complete newbie. After his app failed to gain success early on, he gave up on the idea of a social networking app and went back to hacking. The first thing he did was create a key logging program. This program allowed Dalton to gain access to people's computer and keep track of all the stuff they type, including sensitive information like your bank account. The only downfall of this is that it was used via a thumb drive, so the only way you could actually infect someone's computer is seeing them in person. Shortly after creating his first keylogger program, he found himself on the Hack Forums website, and within a few months of joining Hack Forums, he started running his own booting service, where people paid a monthly fee to have access to his botnet that he used to DDoS people. It got so big that he even outsourced all of the customer service work to other people he knew on the Hack Forums website, so that he could remain focused on finding things to amplify his DDoSing service's power. And then one day, the customer service team received a message from Oh Knows 1479 aka Josiah. He was inquiring about the DDoSing service and asked to speak to the creator. So from there, Josiah and Dalton started talking, and eventually became pretty good friends. Dalton went as far to say that Josiah is probably the smartest hacker he's ever met. Over time, they transitioned from only talking on hack forums to eventually moving to Skype and then finally TeamSpeak. They would stay up all night together trying to find out different ways to amplify the traffic in their DDoS attacks. It was almost like a friendly rivalry between the two. Dalton and Josiah would oftentimes create their own websites or just use people they know to see how much traffic they're actually sending. On average, they'd be sending over 100 gigabits per second. These attacks were so strong that most of the time this happened, they not only booted off their target website, but they also booted off their hosting server, which meant a whole other list of websites that used that hosting server were offline too. After witnessing the power these two held firsthand, Josiah admitted that at this point, he became a little bit more malicious with his hacking goals, but not everything was going to be an attack on someone else. He just said that he got angry sometimes and would take it out on those people through DDoS attacks. But Dalton was a complete completely different story. By the time he met Josiah, he was already running a business that profited off the destruction he caused, so he had no innocence about who he was or what his goals were, and he was not ashamed of who he was or what he was doing. He reportedly bragged that whenever anyone on the hacker forum's website would annoy or bother him, he'd immediately boot them offline. Sometimes his attacks were so powerful that their internet service provider would cut off their access for up to 24 hours just to minimize collateral damage caused. Throughout the years, both Dalton and Josiah had managed to keep their involvement in the hacking world a secret from their families. But unfortunately for Dalton, this all would change in just a few short days. Dalton had a friend that had been working for his booter service that he met online, and they were pretty close, to the point where Dalton felt comfortable telling him his real name. But one morning while Dalton was checking the business's revenue accounts, he came to the realization that that very friend of his had been stealing a percent of their profits. So he fired him immediately, not thinking anything of it or that any concept consequences would come of that, and at first he was correct in that assumption. But just a few days later, while him and his family were sitting around eating dinner, several police officers busted through the door wearing bulletproof vests, wielding shotguns and assault rifles. They immediately took aim at Dalton's head while barking and yelling orders telling everyone to get down on the ground. It turns out that Dalton had been swatted by the kid he fired just a few days prior. The kid told police that Dalton had shot his mother and was holding the rest of his family hostage. Obviously, upon their arrival and entering the house, when they realized there was no hostage situation, they let the family go and uncuffed them, and took the guns away from their face. When tensions finally settled, Dalton was able to explain to police that the whole reason for this was he made another kid angry online playing video games, which obviously wasn't the truth, but for him, it allowed him to conceal his activity in the hacking community. Out of all the lessons he could have learned from this, the one that stuck out most to Dalton was no longer giving his name to people online, except for Josiah, because he trusted him wholeheartedly. A few months after the swatting incident took place, when Dalton was 15 years old, his dreaded childhood stutter came back when he met a new kid at high school who also had a stutter. And it was just as bad as before, but this time he's in high school, so the kids are meaner. He remembers on days where he would deliver laptops to different students that he would have to read their name out in front of the class when he makes a delivery. Oftentimes he'd stutter and slip up on their name, resulting in the entire class laughing and pointing at him. All of this ridicule made Dalton very insecure and made him very depressed.
Dust. He became a recluse. He spent even more time at his computer and in the cyber world, because in his eyes there was no way to normal life or a normal job. Why would anyone hire someone who can't even say their own name? He would tell himself that there were no other options for him, and he had nothing to lose anyways, so he began his journey to becoming a professional black hat hacker third hacker involved in this crew was named Paras Ja. When Paras was less than one year old, his family emigrated from Mumbai to the United States, specifically New Jersey. Like a lot of kids, his parents wanted him to be a complete perfectionist in the classroom, nothing but A's. And for Paras, this was pretty easy, because he was very academically gifted. But unbeknownst to his parents, Paras had very difficult times focusing in school. Although he was very smart, he got bored very easily. This became very evident to him when he realized he couldn't study every night because within minutes he'd be bored. During his later years of middle school, this inability to focus became a problem. He started missing out on assignments and just not doing any homework, which his parents didn't like at all. So they grounded him a lot. They wouldn't let him leave the house. But for Paras, that wasn't a huge issue because he loved computers. But during the weekdays of these groundings, he couldn't play any video games by order of his parents. So instead he sat inside of Microsoft's Visual Studio and taught himself how to program for hours every day. By the time Paras entered high school, the new hot game was Minecraft, and Paras couldn't get enough of it. But his interest didn't lie in casually playing the game. His main goal was to own his own Minecraft server, and eventually he actually accomplished that goal. Paras was the owner of his own Minecraft server. He loved the coding aspect as it related to programming, and he also loved going invisible, going around the server, and changing things in front of the user's eyes, and watching them be amazed. So basically he got a mini power trip from it too. It didn't take long for Paras to discover that he could get paid thousands of dollars to use his coding skills and help other Minecraft servers build games for their server. If you didn't know already, Minecraft servers can be very profitable. Some of the big ones make upwards of $20,000 a month. Just from users of the server buying premium memberships to unlock certain features or games. But they are also very common targets of DDoS attacks. From either mad players that got banned, or just people who don't want to see them making money. So oftentimes, a lot of these big servers ended up having to pay thousands of dollars per month to DDoS protection firms. One day when Paras was was editing his Minecraft server. He joined a Skype call with one of his friends who also owned a server, and this friend of his was interested in DDoSing one of his rival servers, so he made a post on hack forums asking if anyone could help him. Within minutes of them making this post, they had a reply from a user going by the name Lightspeed. They checked his profile, and judging by all the reviews and achievements he had, it was safe to say this hacker was pretty notorious in the DDoSing space. This was actually Josiah. He had changed his username from Onos1479 to Lightspeed about nine months after joining hack forums. After talking on hack forums for a while, Paras and his friend decided to go through with the attack using Josiah as the DDoS source. So Josiah, Paras, his friend, and a few other people decided to join the target Minecraft server to watch all the madness unfold, and they also started up a Skype call together. Once the server had fully loaded up, Josiah told everyone on the call that he was ready to launch the attack, and with the click of a button, the whole world froze. This frozen state lasted for about 30 seconds, and then everyone was disconnected and brought back to the main menu because the server had gone offline. Watching how much power this gave Josiah, and being a part of it directly himself, really made Paras interested in learning how to DDoS people. In the months following this takedown of the Minecraft server, Josiah and Paras became pretty good friends, and reportedly Josiah was very open with telling Paras how he did all this DDoSing, explaining in depth all the methods he used. But the methods that Josiah was using at this point in time weren't the same ones he was using back in the early days with Dalton. Now he was using a much more sophisticated botnet comprised of thousands of different computers that he infected with his own malware by exploiting a flaw in the security protocols of PHP MyAdmin software. Not even one year after Josiah had created this new powerful botnet using the servers of PHP MyAdmin, he found a new way to make an even stronger botnet. This time he gained access to a collection of hundreds of super micro servers. He gained access to these high-powered servers by exploiting a weak point in their baseboard management controllers. The attacks they were able to create using these servers were so strong that it was almost impossible to even measure how much traffic they were actually sending. Whether it was their own website, a Minecraft server, or even a measurement tool, it would be offline within seconds of the attack launching. Paras was absolutely blown away with how powerful Josiah's botnet had become, and he wanted a piece of the action. So Josiah decided to help Paras rewrite his code and amplify the power. He 
He even gave Paras a few thousand computers from his botnet so that Paras could have a stronger one himself. Within just a few months of being under Josiah's wing, Paras had a newfound power and strength in his botnet. He gained a much better understanding of how DDoSing actually works, and botnets in particular, but also increased the strength of his personal botnet at the very same time. It was around this time when Paras had entered the 10th grade, and because the material was harder and he didn't really do any schoolwork or study, he started to fall behind even more than he already was. But that didn't bother him one bit, because online in the hacking world, he was the man. His new and improved botnet had given him the ability to knock offline anyone who ever talked shit to him. He would even go as far as to find the phone number of Minecraft servers, just so he could call them and taunt them while he hit them offline in real time. He wouldn't even ask for any type of money or ransom. All he wanted was the ego boost and to hear them panic. He even took down arguably the biggest Minecraft server of all time, called Hypixel, sitting in the bedroom of his parents' house on a school night. By this point in time, all the guilt was gone. Josiah, Paras, and Dalton had fully leaned into their new life as cyber criminals. But out of the group of friends, Josiah could easily be considered the one that's most far gone. He had started selling the methods he used to amplify DDoS attack traffic and was making on average a few hundred dollars per customer. He also reverse engineered Skype's code and found a way to pull people's IPs. Then he used that to create an IP extraction tool and would sell that on a per use basis to other hackers and DDoS people. Even when there was no monetary gain involved, the stuff Josiah was doing was definitely more serious and more malicious. Some kid on one of the many hack forums that Josiah was a part of was bragging about his dynamic IP address that reset and changed every time he rebooted his router, and Josiah took that as a challenge. Josiah used a trace route command and found the IP of every router between this kid bragging online and his internet service provider. Once they had all these IPs, Josiah and a friend began to hit off each router one by one, which resulted in the entire town surrounding that random kid bragging about his dynamic IP address, losing access to their internet for hours. Yep, you heard that right. Josiah DDoSed an entire town just to prove a point to one kid he didn't even know. The crazy part is, Josiah was never punished for any of this, and in his mind, the police would never bat an eye at him because his botnet was not big enough to even draw their attention. But in the year 2014, when Josiah was around 16 years old, this would all change as the size of his botnet grew immensely. The reason behind this massive explosion in growth for his botnet was pretty simple. A friend pointed out that they could actually hack into people's home routers and configure them in a way that they can be used as zombie devices in Josiah's botnet. The first thing he did was build a piece of malware that would be compatible with these home routers, and he would use something called Telnet to remotely install this malware. After some long nights of hard thinking, Josiah would decide to name this piece of code Qbot. He quickly realized how powerful this tool actually was and the levels of mass destruction he could cause using it. So this time around, he was much more careful with who he shared this code to. He didn't give it to anyone except for Dalton, Paras, and a few other young hackers that the group of three had begun to hang out with. Or at least that was the original plan, because Josiah ended up also sending this Qbot code to one other person, going by the name Viper. Now, I'm not totally sure why Josiah would give this kid the code, because as it says online, it was pretty well known that Viper would like to trade in other people's secrets in exchange for clout and a better reputation. And that's exactly what happened. Viper ended up sending this code to everyone in his contacts, just to boost his reputation in the hack forums community and get a little bit of clout. Once it became very obvious that other people had somehow found access to this Qbot code, Dalton was very unhappy and decided to retaliate. So he hired a guy on Fiverr to make a diss track against Viper, and he uploaded it to YouTube. When Viper initially saw the diss track, it really pissed him off. So in response, he decided to threaten to swat all three of them. And neither Josiah, Dalton, or Paras wanted that to happen. So they came up with the idea of using Qbot to hold Viper offline for as long as they possibly could. They attacked his home router and his service provider routers. So in their head, they think they knocked off his entire town's internet. But the only confirmation that they ever got was actually seeing the devices go offline. And surprisingly, it actually worked. Viper completely disappeared from the hack forum side of the internet and never tried to fuck with Josiah, Dalton, or Paras ever again. For Josiah, this whole Viper incident was just kind of the tipping point and made him realize how quickly all of this hacker stuff can spill over into your real life. So Josiah decided to completely abandon hack forums and his Lightspeed profile for more than a whole year, but he was still practicing his coding skills and talking with his friends Paras and Dalton every day, regardless of how inactive he was on hack forums. But for Paras, it was a 
completely different story. His life was in a downward spiral, and he was half the person he used to be. He couldn't even recognize himself. During the fall of 2014, Paras had started school at Rutgers University, but he quickly realized that the college experience wasn't as great as people made it out to be. He had no friends, and the only social interaction he would get is talking to his roommate. And on top of that, he realized he couldn't even enroll in most of the programs he wanted to join, because as a freshman, he didn't get priority to enrollment. So in his eyes, it was a complete waste of time and money. But after a little bit of thinking about it to himself, Paras soon realized that there may be a solution to this after all. Unfortunately for Rutgers University, that solution entailed Paras attacking them with all of his botnets, including one made up of wireless home routers that he infected with Qbot. The plan was simple. Paras would DDoS the university server so that no one could register for these courses, because if he couldn't, no one can. He would target the university servers three times in a row, hitting them completely offline for days at a time. And in typical Paras fashion, he would taunt the university on Twitter every day under the alias OGX Focus. Eventually, Paras stopped his attack and the servers came back online, allowing all the students to enroll into these classes like nothing had happened. So basically, Paras did this whole DDoS attack for nothing other than proving a point. A few months later, when all of Paras's college exams started to pop up, he took down their network again for a few more days just so he could procrastinate a little bit more. And then a few months after Paras took his exams, he took down the Rutgers University network once again just to prevent his parents from seeing his final grades. After this attack, Paras took a little bit of a break from attacking Rutgers, but only for a few months. Because in the spring of 2015, he would attack again. But this time around, the attack was so powerful that there was no internet at Rutgers for almost a week, and it resulted in several students requesting refunds on their tuition. By the time Paras was a sophomore in college, he had realized that it wasn't a good fit for him. Even though the attacks he pulled against Rutgers gave him some feeling of power, after they were over, all of that power was gone and all of his problems were still there. So he started debating the idea with Josiah that they created a startup to protect people from DDoS attacks. Paras was a bit skeptical, but for Josiah, it all made perfect sense. He had become an expert in DDoSing over the years, so creating a business to stop people from the very attacks he created should be a goldmine. After a few weeks went by of the two talking daily about the idea, Paras finally decided to take some action and borrowed $10,000 from his dad. With that $10,000, Josiah and Paras founded a company called Pro Traff Solutions, which was short for Protected Traffic Solutions. During his earlier days in the Minecraft community, Paras had garnered a reputation as a very skilled programmer amongst a lot of the Minecraft server admins. So Josiah and Paras both decided that maybe they should go after Minecraft servers for their first initial base of customers, but they very quickly realized that this wouldn't be an easy task, despite all of their former achievements and accolades. The main reason for Paras and Josiah's difficulty in obtaining customers was that a lot of these Minecraft servers didn't like to switch DDoS protection firms unless there was an actual attack and their company failed to protect them. So they did what any good hackers would do. They decided to start hitting off all of these Minecraft servers and then offering them their protection services as a way to stop the attack. And for a while, this mafia-like strategy actually worked. Over 10 different Minecraft servers immediately dropped their current provider and switched over to ProTraff Solutions, but with an average order value of between $150 to $200 per month, they didn't make much. They were spending much more than they were making just maintaining their infrastructure and servers, and as a result of this poor budgeting and lack of experience, ProTraff Solutions started to die out in the spring of 2016, and Josiah was becoming more and more desperate as to how he could find quick cash to inject into his dying business. And luckily enough for Josiah, it was right around this time when an old friend from the hacker community reached out to him. He told Josiah that he heard about the new massive botnet he had built using infected routers to take down those Minecraft servers, and he was wondering if he'd be interested in creating a new botnet that he would sell to people. Because if he did, he had customers lined up waiting to pay thousands of dollars for access to this service. Josiah liked the sound of this offer a lot, but he had to check it with his business partner, so he called a meeting with Paras. The two talked it over and eventually came to the agreement that this was their only option if they wanted to keep ProTraff alive. So they immediately got to work creating the biggest and most powerful botnet they'd ever had their hands on. It had been over a year since Josiah's old friend Viper had leaked the Qbot source code to the hacker community, and since then the community had made some changes, the most popular one being a version of the Qbot code where infected routers would act as worms. Once this version of the Qbot code malware was installed on a router, it would automatically look for other hackable devices 
viruses. So basically the malware could spread itself to other home routers until there was literally not a single router left to be infected. Josiah and Paras decided that they would check out this new QBot code for themselves just to see how good it really was. And upon closer examination, they realized it was actually terribly unreliable and not all that great. At first glance, it sounds amazing. A self-spreading virus that can gain access to anyone's home router. But Josiah knew better than that. Due to his many years in this industry, he knew that someone's hacked home router was not a great spot to be in when trying to infect another router. They're weak and poorly built machines, and they were not made to find exploitable vulnerabilities in other machines. And on top of that, the fact that it was 100% decentralized meant that it was very slow and almost impossible to upgrade. So Josiah and Paras designed a faster and more reliable code to infect these new machines. And this is how it worked. First, they would infect someone's router like they always had, using Telnet. And once that first home router became infected, it would automatically scan for other hackable devices nearby. Once the infected home router had found another machine or home router that it was able to hack, it would automatically report this device to a type of loader server. And on that loader server, it would eventually build up a very big list of hackable devices and then automatically infect them using Telnet, which was way faster than having these weak and inefficient home routers try and infect other home routers. This new infection method that they had created was over 100 times as fast as the QBot code that was leaked and upgraded by the hack forums community. The night that they had completely finished and finalized everything in this new infection method, Josiah decided to turn it on and leave it on overnight while he slept. To his surprise, when he woke up in the morning, he could see he had access to over 160,000 devices. For some reference on the scale here, Josiah's previous botnet had less than 10,000 devices involved that he had gained access to over months, but this new one gained him access to over 160,000 in less than 24 hours. When Josiah saw just how big his botnet had grew overnight, the idea of making a little bit of money just enough to pump some cash into ProTrap solutions went completely out the window, and his new goal was figuring out how he could make as much money as possible with this new cyber attack method and how he could spread it as far as possible. So Josiah messaged his old friend Dalton and told him about the new thing that him and Paras were working on. He told Dalton that he would cut him in if he helped him find new devices to exploit. As soon as Dalton heard how big this botnet already was, he was in. So the three began working as a team again. Over the next few days, Dalton found over 10,000 new devices that they would be able to gain access to, and they weren't just home routers this time. It was basically any smart appliance that Dalton can get his hands on. And this became their routine for weeks. Dalton would scan for new devices they could exploit and also write a code to infect them. Then Josiah would overlook that code and refine it to make it perfect. And Josiah was also the one who created the software to actually take control of these new devices that Dalton found. While Josiah and Dalton handled the new devices, Paras was upkeeping the administration software for their command and control server. And after just a few short weeks, their botnet grew to 650,000 devices. And Paras knew that a botnet of this size was sure to gain some attention from agencies they did not want looking at them. So in an effort to hide their identities, Paras decided to create some dummy accounts to promote the botnet. And to go along with these dummy accounts, he also created some fake docs information so that if they ever were tracked, the blame would ideally fall on the people Paras chose. In some of his free time, Josiah was also working on making their link to their command and control server harder to see. He did this by finding and hacking a French server that was used to trade pirated movies. Once they gained access to the server, they used it as a quote jump point for actually connecting to their command and control server. So it made it look like the owner of this French server was actually the brains behind their botnet. There was a woman by the name of Allison Nixon who had been aware of Josiah and his little group of friends for a good long while now. And at the time, she was just a simple cybersecurity professional working in New York. But nowadays, she's the chief research officer at a very prominent cybersecurity firm in the United States. But despite who she works for now, at the time when she first caught wind of the user Lightspeed on hack forums, she had little to no power as she worked security operations for Dell. During her time working for Dell, she said that there was a lot of downtime just due to the fact that there weren't many attacks for her to actually address, which led to her endlessly roaming the internet during the night hours. And one day, like everyone else in this story, she stumbled across hack forums. And Allison wasn't a malicious hacker and wasn't involved in this type of devious cybercrime community. She was basically the exact opposite. So when she saw how these kids were openly selling their hacking toolkits and booter services and things like that with no punishment, she was amazed and disgusted. The more time that Allison spent on the hack forums website, 
website, the more evident it became that a lot of these people selling quote hacking services were not even making their own attack methods. Most of everything being sold on the website came from a few highly skilled people. One of them was Lightspeed, aka Josiah. She claims that almost every booter service on the website originated from Lightspeed. Whether it was someone just selling his service with no changes made for cheaper than he was, or they would make a minor tweak to the code and pass it off as their own. It was clear to her that this guy Lightspeed was different from most of the people on hack forums. He wasn't just some script kitty acting tough online, he truly understood how everything worked and was a real hacker. In 2014, roughly one year after her first run-in with Lightspeed on hack forums, Allison quit her job working for Dell and quote, took a job hunting hackers full-time. Which coincidentally was right around the same time that Josiah and Parost decided to turn ProTraf solutions into an attack service, and when his QBot code was leaked. By the end of her first year hunting hackers full-time, Allison was still spending a lot of time on hack forums, so she was able to witness firsthand the carnage caused by the the QBot code leaking. Quite a lot of people were able to get their hands on QBot, but two groups in particular really caught Allison's eye and were making a lot of trouble using it. One group went by the name VDOS, the other was Lizard Squad, which I'm sure some of you who aren't even deep into the hacking stuff have heard of. Both of them had used QBot to build their own botnet and were selling access to a booter service, but Lizard Squad in particular was very well known in the gaming community, as they had taken Xbox and PlayStation offline multiple times. Most notably though, on Christmas Day of 2014, they used their QBot powered botnet to take down Xbox Live and Call of Duty Ghosts for hours. Players all over the world were complaining about it, including myself. The crazy thing is though, they only had about 135,000 devices in their botnet, and they were able to take down a billion dollar company for hours. Meanwhile, Josiah and his friends at their peak had 650,000 devices in their botnet, so the damage they can cause is really inconceivable. Soon after, after Allison watched this all unfold, she decided to create some honey pots with a colleague at her new firm, in hopes that they could catch a lizard squad and find out their next targets. Almost two years later, in September of 2016, Allison and her colleague were monitoring their honey pots, when all of a sudden they came across a new set of code that was infecting routers and smart appliances all across the world. This unfamiliar string of code was able to recognize when it was running on a honey pot, and it would immediately terminate itself. That that little string of code is what we now know today as Mirai, and it just so happened to belong to Josiah and his crew. Within just months of Allison seeing the Mirai code for the first time, it had reached the top of the food chain in its ecosystem. VDOS, Lizard Squad, and every other hacker group in between had basically vanished from the internet, which is most likely due to the fact that Josiah and his crew kept updating Mirai, and at one point they decided to cut the connection to Telnet on devices that were already infected, which made it basically impossible for them to be reinfected by other hacker groups. So within just months of its creation, it had completely erased all of its competition, and there was an endless supply of routers and smart appliances that were ripe for the taking. Although Allison and other people in the cybersecurity community were aware of this massive botnet, they didn't know exactly why it existed yet, because Josiah and his crew hadn't targeted anyone. But unknowingly to Allison and everyone in her circle, that was all about to change. On September 18th of 2016, Josiah Ross and Dalton launched an attack against the French server provider OVH. The attack lasted about four days and would reach almost one terabyte per second in traffic, which is likely one of the biggest attacks ever seen. And what's really crazy to me about this is they reached this level of traffic only using 145,000 out of their 650,000 infected devices. While this whole ordeal was happening, the founder of OVH tweeted out that the attack was done using cameras and DVDs. VRs, which certainly fits the MO and operating procedures of Josiah, Paras, and Dalton. It's unclear why they decided to attack OVH, but if I had to guess, I would assume it was at the request of a client who paid for their DDoS service, or it was being done as a form of marketing to show their strength to a potential client. On September 22nd of 2016, which was also the final day of the attack on OVH, an independent reporter in the cybersecurity community had been hit offline as well, and the attack on his website reached 
averaged upwards of 600 gigabytes per second, so not quite a terabyte, but close. This man's name was Brian Krebs, and he was a very prominent figure in this community. A lot of people knew of him and respected his work, but it wasn't Josiah, Paras, or Dalton who hit off Brian Krebs. It was one of their clients who was from Brazil. This same client also used their DDoS service to take down the Rio Olympics website for reasons unknown to them. As soon as this guy said he wanted to attack the Rio Olympics, Josiah knew he could be a potential threat to their safety, so he decided to try and limit his use time with their DDoS service. But the Brazilian guy had figured out a loophole where he could manually restart the attack and bypass the time limit, and because of that he was able to hold Brian Krebs offline for days. Once they became aware that their DDoS service was used to take Brian Krebs offline, they immediately called an emergency meeting. Within minutes they all agreed that attacking a well-known journalist in the space was completely too far and was definitely going to draw unwanted attention, but considering the fact that their DDoS service had only brought in roughly $14,000 in cryptocurrency in almost a year, that seems like the pretty obvious decision to make. The risk to reward ratio is just not enough, but it wasn't their botnet that was the problem. It was the DDoS for hire industry itself, and they were all very aware of that. I think everyone was. So when an old client of theirs from Russia had contacted them and told them about an industry called click fraud that would entail much less risk and could be way more profitable, they were all ears. The Russian guy explained that all they would have to do is use their already massive botnet to make fraudulent clicks on advertisement websites where they'd be paid on a per click basis instead of using the bots to DDoS websites. When they heard that they'd be able to make more money without adding anything new to their business idea, they all agreed that they should switch over from DDoS attack for hire to click fraud. But this DDoS tool was their real passion project, so they didn't want to write it off just yet. So Paras decided in one last ditch effort that he would attempt to add Brian Krebs' IP address to a block list so the Brazilian guy could not attack him anymore and they could still keep him as a client. Unfortunately for them, just a few short days after attempting to block Brian Krebs' IP address, they realized the Brazilian guy had attacked him again. But even if Krebs hadn't been attacked again, it was already too late. They were right about that gut feeling they had during their emergency call. Attacking Krebs even one time was way too far and they crossed the line because now they're in the crosshairs of one of the most powerful government agencies on the planet. The attack on Krebs made so much noise in the cybersecurity space that a Marine named Elliot Peterson, who was now working for the FBI stationed out of Anchorage, Alaska, decided that he would need to get involved on this case. Because Krebs didn't have some rinky-dink website that was easy to hit offline, he was covered by a DDoS protection firm known as Prolexic that is actually one of the biggest and most powerful in the industry. So the fact that Prolexic couldn't absorb the traffic that was being thrown at Krebs, mixed with the fact that they actually dropped him and told him they could not work with him anymore due to that one attack, Elliot knew that this new bot net tool was not something to be messed around with and it was very powerful so he immediately got to work doing everything he could to find the creators of the Mirai botnet and he actually got a pretty lucky break early on the billion dollar search engine giant Google reached out to Brian and offered to help him get his site back online using their new pro bono DDoS protection tool project shield which they claimed could absorb the internet's biggest attacks unsurprisingly Brian was thrilled with the idea and they went ahead with it so within a few hours his site was back up and running Running. But with a new DDoS protection firm came a new IP, so that meant Josiah's efforts to block Brian's old IP were completely useless, and the Brazilian customer could begin to attack him again, which he did. And that would prove to be a very fatal mistake, because unlike last time, Google was able to absorb all the traffic, and Brian's website stayed online throughout the entire attack. And once Google saw the large amount of traffic being sent their way, they contacted Brian Krebs and asked permission to send the IP addresses to the FBI, to which he agreed. So Google promptly sent over all of the IP addresses used in the attack to the FBI. Elliot Peterson and the rest of his team began to look through all of the data with the hopes of finding a device nearby that they could reach out and contact the owner to have him send it to their field office so they could use it as evidence and potentially gain some more information about Mirai. They soon realized that there were thousands of infected devices all across Alaska and it was the same in basically every other state across the entire country. But now came the hard part of actually convincing a homeowner in rural Alaska to send their infected device to the FBI. Luckily, they were able to convince the owner of a hunting lodge in Ketchikan to unplug their infected security camera and send it to the Anchorage field office, and that was all Elliot needed. From that point, he launched a formal investigation into the Mirai hackers. They began the investigation by simply asking around on hack forums if anyone had any connection to Mirai because they were interested in purchasing their DDoS services, but that didn't prove fruitful as no one really responded or helped them. Their first lead actually came from an infected device they were able to
able to get their hands on. Using this infected device, they were able to get their hands on a complete sample of the Mirai code, and they found that it was directly connected to a command and control server hosted by a DDoS protection firm known as BackConnect. So he made some calls and got in touch with the management team at BackConnect. He asked them about the Mirai server that they had hosted, and if they still had contact with the people who controlled it. The management team told Elliot that they didn't know exactly who controlled it, but they had a friend who worked at a company called Protraf Solutions named Paras Ja, who might know. Now at first glance, you might think that BackConnect actually betrayed them and gave up Paras to the FBI, but that's not what happened. Back when Josiah and Paras were still trying to make Protraf Solutions into a company that could actually make money, you might remember that Paras created a fake extortion attempt against a Minecraft server that Protraf Solutions used to protect, and he blamed the extortion attempt on one of the dummy profiles he had created for Mirai, going by the username Ristorini, and that's why BackConnect recommended Paras Ja to Elliot Peterson, because they actually thought that the Mirai creators had tried to attack Paras and Protraf Solutions. Once the BackConnect management team told Elliot about Paras, he went online and found Protraf Solutions' website. He contacted the number associated with it and left a voicemail. Within a few hours of leaving that voicemail, Paras called Elliot back. The conversation was brief. Paras told Elliot that he didn't know Ristorini or any of the other creators of Mirai, but that he would surely reach out if he knew anything, and that was where the call ended. Immediately after they hung up, Paras called Dalton and Josiah and told them the FBI was on their ass. They were all panicking, and Dalton decided that they should all just destroy Mirai, completely wipe the command and control servers, and destroy any hard drive of computers they used to manage it. Basically, just sever all connection and go completely radio silent. But Paras had a bit more of an aggressive approach to the situation. He suggested that they release the source code onto hack forums, with the hopes that another Cuba situation would arise, where so many people would have the Mirai code that they could just kind of sink back into the massive amount of people and hide. But Dalton was adamant in his disagreement, to the point where him and Paras got into a yelling match, which was their first real fight as friends. But the yelling didn't really get them anywhere. Dalton still didn't think the code should be released, and Paras thought releasing the code was the best move. Throughout this entire call, Josiah didn't really say much. He didn't want to pick sides and was frankly shell-shocked that the FBI was actually chasing him. The stalemate of ideas resulted in them ending the call abruptly, and they were only in agreement on one thing. Their Mirai journey had come to an end, but they still weren't all in unanimous agreement on what to do with the source code. So Paras took it upon himself, and in September of 2016, he leaked the Mirai source code under the pseudonym Anna Senpai. So regardless of what Dalton thought was appropriate, Paras gave access to the Mirai code to every single DGen on hack forums. Within days, there were copycats all over hack forums boasting their new botnet size. One user even reached 86,000 devices within days of getting the code. When Elliot Peterson found out of the Mirai code leaking, he was pissed. But not because the Mirai creators were going to get away. It was just so grotesquely risky in his eyes. Having access to something that powerful and just throwing it around willy-nilly like that, it's very reckless. But he wasn't angry for very long because Elliot and the FBI would catch another break within a month after the Mirai code leaking. Back in 2014, when Allison Nixon took her job hunting hackers full-time, she attended a cybersecurity convention where she performed DDoS attacks live to demonstrate just how dangerous they could be. And Elliot Peterson was in the crowd that day, and he became friends with Allison. The two became so close and aligned in their views that they decided to create an anti-DDoS group called Big Pipes, comprised of Elliot and his FBI team, and Allison and a few other university researchers. The Big Pipes group created several online honeypots in an attempt to catch these hackers, as you may remember me mentioning earlier in the video. And they would prove useful once again, just like they did before for Allison. But this time, the clue they got was much bigger. It wasn't just a piece of code. Some of the university researchers were looking through the honeypots when they noticed a US-based IP that tried to access them for scanning about two months prior to the Mirai source code leaking. So Elliot decided to contact the hosting company for the US-based IP address they found in their honeypots, and upon getting in touch with them, they gave him the subscriber name Josiah White. And Elliot was already familiar with this name, because as I mentioned, he had already visited the ProTraf Solutions website, so he could easily see that Josiah is listed as a co-founder. So once again, he called up ProTraf Solutions, but this time requested to speak to Josiah. Upon answering the phone, Josiah was met with questions about a Mirai prototype scanning tool that they found in a honeypot with a US-based IP address linking to Josiah White. This caught him quite off guard, and in his brain, internet scanning wasn't a crime. So he admitted that yeah, he'd done some scanning, which he was correct about. Internet scanning is not illegal, but what he didn't realize 
is that he just confirmed he owned the Mirai prototype scanning tool. So as soon as Elliot heard him say this, he knew he had him. And within a few minutes, the call was ended. Now that Elliot Peterson knew Josiah had some type of control of Mirai, he became even more suspicious of his business partner at ProTrav Solutions, Paras Ja. So Elliot and his team of FBI agents began sending legal requests to every single dummy account Paras had ever created for Mirai. Even though Elliot had practically caught Josiah red-handed on their phone call, he knew there were still other creators out there, and he was determined to find them. So he kept digging on hack forums, and eventually he came across an account called Fireswap, whose posts mainly consisted of talking shit about people who didn't like the Mirai botnet, and praising the creators of the Mirai botnet. So to Elliot, that's a huge blinking red flag, and he immediately sent a legal request to hack forums to obtain Fireswap's email address. And obviously hack forums complied, so they provided Elliot with the email fireswap1337 at gmail.com. Then Elliot used the email address to contact Google and obtain his subscriber metadata, which includes the IP addresses used to connect to that Gmail account. Once they had access to Fireswap's Google account, they could see that the name attached to it was Bob Jenkins. He could also see the IP addresses used to log in, and he noticed that they were first a VPN slash proxy server, and second that they all matched up to the same IPs used to create the dummy Mirai profiles. But there still wasn't enough to put the blame on Paras. That was until they noticed the IP of Bob Jenkins occasionally would switch every few seconds, and that rare blinking IP they saw actually matched the one that Paras used when connecting to his ProTraf Solutions account. So at this point, Elliot and the FBI had a pretty good link proved between Mirai and Josiah and Paras, but they still didn't know anything about Dalton Norman, and time was running out because the Mirai source code was out there, and there were thousands of copycats ready to use it. Surprisingly enough, the Mirai source code leaking didn't seem to cause any adverse events for about three weeks. But then overnight, the internet got turned upside down. October 21st of 2016 seemed like a normal day at first. Allison Nixon woke up and was heading into work. When she arrived at the Flashpoint office where she had been working since 2014, someone she worked with pointed out that nothing was working on the internet. You couldn't even pull up sites like Google. When Allison pulled out her computer, she was able to realize that dozens of the world's biggest internet websites and their domain name systems were completely destroyed. If you aren't familiar with domain name systems or what it is, I'll do my best to break it down. When the domain name system or DNS is not working for a website, it makes it almost impossible for anyone to actually go to their website. Twitter, Instagram, Netflix, every website like that has its own individual IP address that actually hosts the website and were able to access these services by typing in the company name and then clicking their link to open the website, which will connect us to their server. The domain name system is exactly what I just described. It's the mechanism that allows us to type in human words and reroutes us to the IP address where the service we're looking to use is hosted. So if that domain name system is not working, the average human wouldn't be able to access any of the services they're looking for. When Allison Nixon and her team realized what was going on, they immediately sent DNS requests to some of the biggest websites affected by the outage. Upon receiving the information she requested, Allison realized that there was a common denominator between all the companies affected by this outage. They all shared the same DNS provider, a company called DIN based out of New Hampshire. And DIN was a massive company. It was estimated that over 170,000 websites were offline, as a result directly tied to the attack on DIN's domain name system. Even though she now knew where the outage was stemming from, she still was wondering what caused it. So Allison checked the honeypot that her team at Big Pipes had set up a while ago. She checked the attack logs and to no one's surprise, there was a Mirai variant from one of the copycats that had come up since the leaking. And she could see that it was sending tons of traffic to the DNS server of Sony, the company that owns PlayStation. And because DIN provided the DNS server to Sony, the attack evidently spilled over into DIN's DNS system and completely throttled it. So because of a few kids on hack forums who wanted to troll the company PlayStation, around $700 billion worth of companies, including Airbnb, Amazon, HBO, CNN, Reddit, Xbox Live, The Wall Street Journal, Spotify, CNN, PayPal, and many more were taken offline for hours. So basically, Allison Nixon and Elliot Peterson's biggest fear regarding this group of angsty teenagers online had finally come to fruition, and the world had experienced one of the biggest DDoS attacks ever recorded. Thankfully, the attack was relatively short-lived, as Din was able to get the whole thing 
under control by the afternoon, but the attack had also caused some longer lasting issues that Din would have to deal with. They reportedly lost almost 10% of their client base due to this DDoS attack, which comes out to be a pretty big number when you're a company like Din. But for the actual creators of this Mirai code, the day was a little bit different. It was certainly not all good, but it also wasn't bad. On the one hand, this incident could bring them more charges, and certainly will bring more unwanted attention. But on the other, they saw that this attack carried out on Din was only using less than 100,000 devices, and their botnet had over 650,000. And the code also had no changes to it despite it being quote updated. It was still their original code that did this, so it gave them some sick sense of pride too. Out of everyone involved, Elliot Peterson had arguably one of the most stressful days though, because on the day of the attack, his small time cybersecurity issue transformed into a multinational hundred billion dollar issue. He was receiving calls from the Department of Homeland Security wondering if it was a state-sponsored attack and getting barraged with questions from reporters in a White House press conference. But despite all the pressure from people above him, Elliot felt it deep down that he knew who created Mirai and who gave this person the code, so he decided to stop in and say hi to Paras and Josiah in person. It was a cold, brisk January morning, right before sunrise. The birds were chirping and the whole town was quiet. Josiah was laying in bed after a long night of gaming with Dalton and Paras, trying to get a few hours of sleep before his 8 a.m. shift at his dad's computer repair shop when all of a sudden he heard a loud banging at his front door and he jumped out of bed. He ran over to his computers and shut them all off. Luckily for them, Josiah, Paras, and Dalton all used remote servers and they would only access them using a virtual machine. So once the computers were off, it should erase anything left on the virtual machine. And just before he would shut off his phone, he sent a message to Paras saying 911. After shutting his phone off, Josiah put on a pair of sweatpants and grabbed a t-shirt and made his way upstairs. When he reached the top of the stairs, he entered a long dark hallway going towards the front of his house. As he made his way through the hallway, he started to put his shirt on, and as soon as it went over his head, a flashlight popped up in front of him, unknowingly attached to a gun and a federal agent. The agent told Josiah to drop the shirt and start walking, so with a gun pointed at his back, he began walking out towards his front porch, where unknowingly the rest of his family was already waiting. When Elliot finally reached his front door, he walked out onto the porch and saw his family staring back at him with blank faces. And directly next to them was Elliot Peterson. In a very upbeat tone, he told Josiah, quote, Oh, hi, Josiah. I was hoping we wouldn't meet under these circumstances, but here I am. But Josiah didn't say anything back. He was still processing the whole situation. He was too busy scanning the area around his house, noticing the whole street lined with black SUVs. There were even other FBI agents there from local field offices. And on top of that, there were French intelligence officers standing outside his door because the owner of that French server that pirated movies had actually been raided due to Josiah and his crew using his server. After standing outside on the porch for a few minutes, Elliot Peterson and his team brought everyone back inside for further questioning. The conversation only lasted about 30 minutes and this time Josiah denied everything, including the Mirai prototype scanner. But it was way too late for all that, so Elliot didn't argue with Josiah at all. He simply told him not to inform any of his friends of the raid and left. Not even 24 Four hours later, Paras had his home raided by the FBI as well. But for Paras, the raid was way less stressful because unbeknownst to Peterson, Josiah had sent Paras that 911 text as soon as the raid had happened, which gave him a 12-hour window to delete any evidence, and he had done exactly that. As soon as he received the 911 text from Josiah, Paras immediately got to work deleting any hard drives and hiding storage devices around his house. So by the time he heard the loud bang on his front door at 6 a.m., he was awake and ready. When Paras heard that dreaded knock at the door, he calmly left his room to meet them at the door. He was met with Elliot Peterson and his full team, just like Josiah, but this time there was a twist. They brought an electronic sniffing dog in an attempt to find any hidden hardware devices, which naturally scared Paras a little bit. But in the end, the dog proved to be pretty useless, as the most memorable thing it did during this raid was play with Paras's family dog. After they used the dog to search Paras's house for any valuable hardware and failed, they did the same thing that they did at Josiah's house. They sat down his whole family and had a big talk, where just like Josiah, Paras said nothing, and the conversation came to an abrupt end. After Elliot Peterson heard that Paras wouldn't be giving up any information about Mirai, he got up and left. And as soon as that door closed, Paras looked at his mother and father and claimed his innocence, which I doubt they believe, but I mean, what else is he supposed to tell them? In the following days after the raid on Josiah and Paras's house, they would all hop on a call, including Dalton, and discuss what happened. And they came to the conclusion 
that these raids were simply a scare tactic from the FBI, that they really didn't have anything on them. So they started talking about getting back in business, but this time with a twist. They would take their old Russian client up on his offer. They transformed the Mirai botnet from a DDoS tool into a click fraud cash printing machine. And in less than one year, the Mirai botnet was now raking in over $50,000 a month in revenue, which is a massive step up from the measly $14,000 they had accrued using the Mirai botnet to DDoS people. Josiah and Paras had actually been pretty smart with this money. They realized it was all gained through an illegal business model, so they didn't go out and splurge and draw attention. They stuffed it all away in a shoebox and saved it for a rainy day that they could launder it. But Dalton Norman was not as smart with his share of the money. He would end up spending tens of thousands of dollars within the first few months of making this money, spending it on things like TVs for his parents and upgrading his computer. Just mindless spending like something a lottery winner would do. Even though Josiah and the original Mirai botnet crew left the DDoSing world behind, their code leaking was still causing massive amounts of damage all across the planet. On January 13th of 2017, while Dalton, Josiah, and Paras were presumably rolling around in their piles of money, the UK bank Lloyd's Banking Group and Barclays were hit with an extremely powerful DDoS attack that kept them offline for 48 hours. And of course, this was done using the Mirai code, but this wasn't their fault. Just because their code was now out in the wild and other people were using it for malicious things doesn't mean they'd be punished for it. So they kept their click fraud machine running, completely understanding the idea that this click fraud scheme was either going to make them all rich or land them all in a jail cell. The insane high that Josiah, Paras, and Dalton were experiencing for making this much money at such a young age only lasted a few months. Their prediction of making it one year wasn't even close. They started using the Mirai botnet for click fraud in 2017 and were really making some serious money by the spring. But in the summer of 2017 is when it all went downhill. It started off like a normal sunny summer day, but then Josiah received a phone call and it turned out to be from Elliot Peterson. He told Josiah that he'd like to talk to him at his office in Anchorage, Alaska. So Josiah and his mother booked the tickets and made the 10 hour flight. Upon their arrival, they made their way to the Department of Justice building in Anchorage. Elliot Peterson greeted them at the door and walked them into a conference room inside their building. Waiting for them in the room was a young man named Adam Alexander, who would have been the prosecutor in this case. He was standing by a projector screen with a PowerPoint presentation pulled up and ready to go. Once Josiah, his mother, and Elliot had all taken their seats, Adam began flipping through the list of charges that would apply to Josiah, as well as the prison time he may be facing. Like most of the people I've covered on this channel so far, Josiah broke the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and he was looking at around six or seven years regardless of it being his first offense, if convicted of violating these laws. The next thing Adam Alexander did was go over all the evidence they had against Josiah so far, the most obvious connection being Josiah's use of the Mirai scanner tool. But also by this point they had gotten their hands on his text messages with Paras, which showed their complete conversation during Paras's previous attacks on Rutgers University, saying things like, quote, Admiral, can you execute my command? Which was just their half-assed attempt at speaking in code. And on top of all that, one of the teams at the FBI was able to find instances where Josiah periodically checked in on a Mirai server, but he wasn't connected to his virtual machine. He was simply using his home computer. So they had multiple occasions that proved an IP address from Josiah's house was connecting to Mirai-related servers. Once Josiah heard everything they had on him and the potential prison time he was facing, plus his lawyers in his ear telling him to make a deal and not push his luck, he chose to work with the FBI and told Elliot Peterson that he would love to make a deal. Elliot Peterson and his team at the FBI were thrilled to hear this, but they told Josiah that in order for that to work, he would have to detail everything that happened with Mirai from start to end. So Josiah did just that. He told them why they started, how it started, and everything in between. He even broke down the role of Paras and Dalton in this massive operation for them, which was yet another mistake that Josiah would make because the FBI had no clue who Dalton was. They didn't even know he was involved, but Josiah confessed everything every crime they ever did together, so there was now a target on Dalton Norman's back. But it didn't stop there. He even explained to them their new scheme, the click fraud one, that they had literally just started a few months after their FBI raids took place. And just like Dalton's involvement with Mirai as a whole, they had no clue about their new click fraud scheme until Josiah opened his mouth. So not only did he potentially cause Dalton to lose years of freedom, but he now ruined a $50,000 per month operation, which could have made them all very rich 
despite the DDoS investigation that was going on. This whole conversation worked out way better than Elliot Peterson or anyone at the FBI could have hoped for, but they decided to take it one step further. They told Josiah that the only way this deal would work is if he cooperated fully, meaning he turned into an informant for the FBI and gathered evidence on his former business partners and friends. Josiah unsurprisingly agreed to these terms and hopped on a flight back home. When he first left his house, he was under the impression that he was a cyber criminal who had escaped the FBI, but when he went home, he was now a federal informant. In the weeks following Josiah's return home, he would carry on his life like he usually did. All day, he would work at the computer repair shop that his father owned, and he would come home and hop on a call with Paras and Dalton. After a few calls, it became very evident to Dalton and Paras that something was up with Josiah, because he was acting different. He would want them to do things like break down how their whole operation worked and explain little technical issues, which was very unusual behavior for Josiah, because he seemed to always be ahead of the curve, and was more skilled than Dalton and Paras. Even though they both knew something was off, they still answered the questions that Josiah was asking, because in the end, they owed everything they had to him, and they didn't want to cut ties with one of their best friends without having any evidence, other than a gut feeling. These awkward phone calls went on between the three for a few weeks, until one day Paras's phone started ringing. He answered the phone and was met with a preppy, hey Paras, it was Elliot Peterson. He told Paras that he would like to have a meeting in person with him and his family at his field office in Anchorage, Alaska, just as he did with Josiah. At first, Paras was hesitant to accept the invitation, but after talking it over with Dalton, they both came to the agreement that Paras should take the meeting to at the very least find out what the feds had on them. So he did, and Paras's family got on the plane and made the 10 hour flight. Once they arrived, it was basically the exact same as it was for Josiah. Elliot Peterson met them at the door and led them into a small conference room where Adam Alexander was waiting. The meeting started with Adam Alexander breaking down all of the charges and evidence against Paras, including his link to the many Mirai dummy profiles, as well as his link to the fire swap burner account. At this point, Paras still had some hope left, because for some reason he thought all of that evidence was not solid proof and could be open to interpretation in a court of law. But then the young prosecutor, Adam Alexander, pulled out the final dagger. He began to play a voice recording that Josiah had gathered on one of his recent calls with Paras and Dalton. The call consisted of Paras and Dalton breaking down their entire click fraud scheme, so he was caught red-handed, and finally had his suspicions confirmed that Josiah had betrayed both him and Dalton. After laying out all the evidence and the facts against Paras, Elliot and Adam Alexander told him that they'd be willing to make a deal, but he'd have to cooperate fully just as Josiah did. It didn't take much time for Paras to realize that he was backed into a pretty tight corner here, and his only way out would either be working with the FBI or rotting in a jail cell. So he chose to cooperate, and Elliot Peterson asked Paras if he had told anyone about their meeting today. Paras replied yes that he informed Dalton about it, so Elliot Peterson had Paras call Dalton and put it on speakerphone for everyone in the room to hear. When Dalton answered, Paras told him the FBI had nothing, and he had nothing to worry about. But little did Dalton know, there were about five FBI agents sitting in the background listening to that entire call. In the weeks following Paras's trip to Alaska, Elliot Peterson was preparing to raid Dalton Norman's home. The first thing he did was subpoena Dalton's Yahoo account, and this is where things actually got a bit weird. By mistake, the Yahoo team actually informed Dalton of the legal request made on his account, and suggested in the email informing him of this that he contact Elliot Peterson and left his phone number. So without any hesitation, Dalton picked up the phone, dialed the number, and called Elliot Peterson. Meanwhile, while all of this is going on, he's on a call with Paras and Josiah. When Elliot Peterson picked up the phone, he already knew who was calling him. So the first thing he said was, oh hey Dalton, I'm sorry, I didn't plan on talking to you for a couple of weeks. And Dalton thought it would be best to just act like he didn't know what was happening. So he told Elliot he didn't know who he was or what he wanted. But Elliot knew this was a lie, so he simply laughed out loud. He then told Dalton, quote, we're going to have a great opportunity to have a chat, and ended the phone call. Once the call had ended, Dalton looked back at the call he was on with Josiah and Paras, and simply said, what the fuck was that? Paras replied calmly, quote, your ass. And for the next few weeks, Dalton would have no choice but to sit and wait, letting the anxiety build up for the impending FBI raid. And then finally, three weeks later, after his first interaction with Elliot Peterson on the phone, Dalton heard a loud bang at his front door around dawn. And when the FBI entered his home, they found Dalton sitting in a bean bag in his underwear, watching Star Wars. Because unlike Josiah and Paras, Dalton was completely prepared for this. He had already been swatted once before, so this wasn't the first time people barged in his home pointing guns at him. And he did his best to make it look like he wasn't worried at all, going so far as to even take a nap during the raid, which at first seems a bit irrational. 
emotional, but he did have a lot of time to prepare for this, three weeks to be exact. So by now, he had physically destroyed every sensitive hard drive he had. He even completely tore apart his new computer, and the only money he had on that Bitcoin hard drive he kept inside of a kibble box, surrounded by food, so the FBI would never notice it. And surprisingly, that actually worked. The feds found nothing in their search, and when Elliot Peterson tried to question Dalton for more information about Mirai, Dalton gave him nothing. Within a few days of the raid taking place, it was time for Dalton to make his trip down to Alaska to meet with Elliot. And when he did, Elliot and his team used the exact same strategy they did for his partners in crime. Elliot met them at the door and led them to a small conference room. Once they were there, Adam Alexander was waiting with his PowerPoint presentation. They all took their seats and then they laid out the charges and evidence against Dalton. Once they had covered everything, including more audio recordings and this time some more chat logs, Dalton knew there was no chance. They had him. So just like Josiah and Paras, Dalton agreed to cooperate with the FBI. But this time it went a bit differently. Elliot Peterson didn't tell Dalton to keep this from Josiah or Paras. Instead, he started a phone call and added in Josiah and Paras to it as well, telling the three of them that they'd now be working together instead of against each other. So Elliot began to break down what the terms of this deal would actually be, which included giving up all of their hacking tools, disabling their click fraud botnet, and handing over any funds they gained from the Mirai DDoS tool, to which they all agreed because it was either that or they go to prison. So for the next few years, Josiah, Dalton, and Paras all worked side by side with the FBI to catch Mirai copycats that were still spreading the code and DDoSing people, and just catching other big cyber criminals online using their unique skill set, which all in all isn't a bad deal for them. Not a single one of them spent a day in prison, and after the smoke clears, they'll probably have a job full time working with the FBI. This video would not have been possible without Andy Greenberg and Wired.com. They were the first ones to break the story with an in depth background of why the Mirai botnet happened and how it happened. So if you like videos like this and stories like this, definitely check out Andy Greenberg's work and check out Wired.com. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I love you. Have a good one. Peace.